thanks for joining us again, Consumer Trial Lawyer Academy. I'm Nick Woot. I appreciate you taking some of your valuable time to take a look at our videos, and hopefully this will benefit you in some way. So, um, what do we do when we get our discovery responses in from the defendants? What, what do we do? And what's the steps we go through, and, and how do we handle that? Uh, well, since we're talking about consumer litigation primarily, uh, we know that it's going to follow a pretty standard process. Um, the defense is going to be playing, you know, cat and mouse, hide and seek, hide the ball, whatever you want to call it. Um, their job is to give us nothing. And, you know, our job is to get what we need. So, you know, when we get their discovery in, you know, we, again, it's a multi-level process. We have uh, great support and form of excellent paralegal and uh, staff. We start looking through, you know, what are the answers? Um, if you've done any consumer litigation at all, you know that the first answer is you get a bunch of boilerplate objections, which are always wrong, always objectionable in themselves. Uh, if you're fortunate, you practice in a court where people get sanctioned for boilerplate objections, and that, you know, tends to cut out some of the nonsense, but for the most part, you're going to deal with boilerplate objections and nothing uh, the first go-round. So, what do you do? Um, well, first, uh, go ahead and create yourself a process where, as you're reviewing the discovery, you're, you know, in theory, if you have a multi-screen set up, which I, I hope you do, um, you know, you just put your deficiency letter on one side and the response is on the other. <laughs> because basically, uh, you're going to be writing a, de uh, a deficiency letter as you review your discovery. Um, you know, m most of us are somewhat jaded after we've been at this a while just because it's, it's almost like it's, you know, it's just mandatory. It's, it's almost like because our, our friends on the defense side get paid by the hour, they have to waste as much time as possible uh, with, you know, discovery objections that they know are essentially dead on arrival, for lack of a better term. And unfortunately, we have to contend with that because too, too many times those, uh, you know, types of responses and that type of conduct is just overlooked and tolerated by uh, the judiciary. Um, it is what it is, you know. Uh, your situation and your mileage on these issues will vary based on the judge that you're dealing with and the person you're standing in front of. If they have a low tolerance for it, you won't deal with it very much. If they have a high tolerance for it, you'll deal with it all the time. You know, that's just reality. Um, so we're looking for what answers we got. We're looking for what objections need to be stricken. Uh, we're documenting the fact that we didn't get a privilege log because obviously, you know, unless you're in some rarefied air I've never uh, traveled through, you never get a privilege log until you call to the defendant's attention that they haven't given you a privilege log, which it, again, supposed to result in waiver, but never really seen that enforced either in 26 years doing that. So you're going to fight about a privilege log. You're going to fight about sorry, insufficient, terrible answers full of objections. That's going to be your first efficiency letter. Uh, your first efficiency letter is essentially, hey, you gave me nothing but objections. <laughs> And I need actual answers and a privilege log for all these bogus privilege assertions that have been made. So you're going to have a meet and confer about that process. And once that's done, uh, they're going to ask you for time to supplement. And, you know, you're going to give them that because we're professionals and that's what we have to do. And, uh, you know, that process is going to repeat depending on the defendant and the opposing counsel that process may repeat 
two, three, four, five, ten, fifteen times. Uh, just again, whatever your judge is willing to tolerate. Um, make sure you know your judges. Make sure you know your local rules. Don't go filing a motion to compel without complying with local rules. You'll end up sanctioned. Um, but you know, once you've waded through that obstruction. You've gotten everything they're going to give you voluntarily, and you know there's more, then, you know, at that point you do have to file your motion to compel, um, and, you know, you're going to need to do a good job of documenting every meet and confer, every letter written, every effort to get this resolved, and uh, you're also going to have to explain why what's been withheld is both relevant and proportional to your case. So again, going back to the foundation, start with what you need and what you know is there and and you know fight the fight on the plane of we are certain that this information is available but is being withheld. Um, or fight the fight on the plane of what you learn through discovery, uh, such as depositions of corporate employees that, that tell you what else is there. So, you know, once you've done that, then you have a pretty good idea of, you know, what you're, what you're at and what you need. You know, in mortgage cases, I have, I have watched uh, defendants come in and they give us you know, 100, 200, 300 pages, 600 pages, you know, less than a thousand pages, let's just say it that way. And then we start this process of writing deficiency letters and having meet and confers and threatening motions. And, you know, sometimes by the time we get to the end of that process, we're, we're up into the tens of thousands of pages. Um, you know, we, we had a case where we fought and fought and fought for clone discovery. Uh, I think the first production of documents we got in the case it was an opt-out from a class action. I think our first production was about 500 pages. Uh, went through multiple rounds of deficiency letters, meeting, confers, and motions until finally the judge got frustrated with the very terrible answer she heard and she ordered clone discovery and magically, you know, that was turned 50,000 pages that were, you know, allegedly all relevant to the same conduct that we had in our case. So, again, you know, uh, a matter of being dogged and determined and documenting and making sure that you have everything correct um, on your side and that you know what you're asking for, you know why, you know why it's relevant, you know why it's proportional, all those good things. Um, if you do that, then you know you'll fight that fight to get to a point where uh, you know then you can have your motions to compel and. Hopefully, by the end of that process, uh, you will have gotten to a point where you have the necessary material to go forward and take good depositions, which would be, you know, sort of your next step in that process, um, you know, getting to that point of we've got all these documents in hand. Uh, besides the fact that usually these documents will ultimately lead you to other witnesses, they will you know, help you get your arms around the defendant in the case better and help you do a better job when you do start taking uh, corporate rep depositions in the case. So, again, um, doggy determination, documentation, repeated efforts, don't accept no for an answer because uh, they're just trying to exhaust you. Once you feel confident that you do have the material that you should have or most of it, then it's time to proceed to uh, you know, the motion to compel phase and resolve that issue. And then once you have a final set of documents, then you can prepare for you know, depositions of uh, you know, fact witnesses and corporate reps and be in a position to be more effective. 
Thank you again for joining us. Uh, I hope you found this video helpful. I hope you're finding what we're sharing helpful. Uh, and I hope that uh, this benefits you and your practice as you dig in and fight for justice for your clients. Thanks for watching this video with Consumer Trial Lawyer Academy. Again, I'm Nick Wooten. Uh, happy to be able to spend a few minutes with you and look forward to seeing you again. If uh, you like it, again, whatever it is that YouTube says do, like and subscribe. Uh, do that for us. Help us know that we're uh, providing something useful to everybody out there in YouTube land. Thanks and see you again soon.